Welcome friends to the fourth episode of Venture Forward Together, an interview series highlighting the, highlighting the work and stories of colleagues in the social impact and sustainability fields. We are Victoria Avi and Danielle Doza of Venture Forward Strategies, a consulting firm helping companies make a more positive impact in this world through better social and environmental practices. And we're based in Cleveland, Ohio. And before we dive in and introduce our guests today, uh, let's do a quick check-in with each other. Danielle, what has been a highlight for you this week? My highlight was attending the Virtual Social Impact Storytelling Summit put on by Secret Agents, a new organization out of Montreal that was co-founded by Ian Capstick, who was in Victoria's uh, cohort of the Center for Social Impact Strategy. So it was cool to hear panelists um, in the social impact space. Uh, there were people of indigenous background um, from the LGBTQ plus community. And Nina West, the drag queen, was the second keynote speaker. She's from Columbus, Ohio, and was on RuPaul's Drag Race. And I remember seeing Nina in Columbus back in college over a decade ago. So it's pretty cool to now see her on the international stage talking about social impact work um, and uh, the, the fundraising and support uh, Nina West does for a lot of organizations in Columbus. So that was pretty cool. That's pretty awesome. And Victoria, uh, what's been a highlight for you this week? For me, so on Sunday, I was able to go visit Jackie Lowe Stevenson's farm, uh, Pebble Ledge Ranch. Uh, she was uh, a person we interviewed in our second episode. And so that was pretty wonderful to meet the uh, new members of the family. They have a new dog. Uh, and I got to see the horses and the zebra again. So that was wonderful. That's pretty um, cool. Yeah, so let's get started. All right, yeah, let's get into it. Today, we're chatting with Sylvia Tang, the Demand Planning and Innovation Manager at Alter Eco Foods, which makes some of my favorite chocolates. She's based in San Francisco. Uh, Sylvia and I were in the same cohort at Penn's Social for, uh, Center for Social Impact Strategy in 2018, and she is our first guest from the Penn Network. So I've had the privilege of learning about her work uh, over the past few years and have had the luck of trying several Alter Eco chocolates. <laughs> Sylvia seeks to make the business case for social and environmental sustainability aligning so well with our work. Sylvia, welcome to the show. Uh, let us know how you're doing and if you could introduce yourself a little more and tell us how you got into your work, particularly sustainability and business. Great. Thanks, Danielle and Victoria for having me. Um, I'm doing pretty well and actually as a lot of things are changing with the current pandemic, it means a lot of things for CPG and retail and how people shop. So it's actually been a pretty interesting time, especially um, doing what I do. Um, so I, as you mentioned, I've been at Alter Eco uh, for around three years. Uh, so we are a mission-based company. We try to do kind of everything the right way and then some, um, either through our farmers and fair trade premiums or our supply chains. Uh, we try to be carbon neutral, try to have really clean chocolate for our consumers. So it's kind of the whole spectrum. Uh, for me, it's been a really great balance of, I have a business background and, uh, and then marrying that with my passion for social impact, uh, environmental impact. And um, yeah, I'm kind of a indecisive, jack of all trades, kind of a master of none kind of person. <laughs> yeah. Uh, literally can't decide, I have trouble describing my job description to anyone that asks me. Um, so um, yeah, that's kind of been my whole history. I've been at Alter Eco. I've been in all, all four departments at some point <laughs> in the past three years from forecasting and from sales data to now I'm doing some of the innovation launches. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how, what I'm doing now. Um, looking back, when I mean, you kind of look back on um, the, the like funny road on how you got there, it doesn't make sense at the time, but now it's like, oh, it all makes sense to where you are now. Um, so I, I went to school, I went to school at Berkeley for business, and I actually was also majoring in, um, they call it society, the environment, society and the environment. Um, so it's kind of environmental issues, but more intertwined with social issues, because I like to think of, um, can't really separate the two, right? Like, it's great to preserve forests, um, but if nobody's interacting with them where people's needs aren't being met, then people aren't uh, interested or invested. So that's kind of where I came from. Um, there are literally two opposite sides of campus. 
and two opposite side types of people it was like the hippies on one end and like the super intense business <laughs> people on the other end um, so I like I was little and there I was just like running up and down the hills to get to those so that's kind of like a good metaphor for my background um so after school I was in management consulting for a few years um almost three years so went the very business route um and I found myself kind of sneaking out of work early to go to some sustainability food, food panel or like this talk or whatever. And uh, I would get so fired up spending all this extra time outside of work doing that. I'm like, I should really just uh, try to put more of my time and my career into that. So yeah, I've uh, at that point told myself kind of, I'll do anything to get into sustainability and food. Uh, Cause I thought that's where really a lot of things intersect. Food is where people, Everybody needs food. It impacts social, impacts environmental. It's like some of the biggest carbon contributors um, if you look at like the top five. So that's uh, where I started my search. And then it kind of led me to funny things like I was in grass-fed beef for two years, which is a very funny time in my life, but also like a great, um, it was a small company, 10 people, I think, got to learn like every aspect of the business um and then take all that business knowledge and like really learn about how food interacts and how mission gets driven into the business and then led me to alter eco and then once you're in the food world it's actually not that uh big you start knowing everyone else there so then yeah met someone who was working at alter eco and um that's that's all she wrote for now <laughs> that's great yeah thanks for sharing um you know, I've uh, loved Alter Eco for a while, so it was it was uh, fun to meet someone who worked for the company um, and learn more about the company. So yeah, we're definitely excited to have you on and talk more about that. And one thing we have talked about a lot, to, you know, on the show and to all of our friends, um, is, is the Center for Social Impact Strategy program that we've done. Mm -hmm. um, you know, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, if you've uh, integrated any resources or knowledge from that program um, into your work and kind of how you think about social impact in your work. Yeah, I um, you know, went to Alter Eco doing a lot of forecasting and sales data planning. Um, and like I had been so drawn to the company for its mission and all its impact that it was doing, but I felt like my job was getting a little, like I was going too far into the business deep end again. Um, and so that's how I came upon CSIS and Penn. Um, and it was kind of great because uh, it built that bridge. It does really kind of make you think that business and social impact are so t intertwined, like the practices and the, the rigor and the, the things, the exercises they teach you. Um, it, they're like kind of, a lot of them are straight from like business textbooks a bit. And it's like really builds that bridge, but like helps you keep the compassion of social impact, but like build all those like really concrete things that you need to get it done. So um, that was nice for me because it kind of reinforced like, yes, you can have be along this like spectrum of for profit and nonprofit and apply those things and mix it together. So that was good for me in that way to just like reinforce how I come into it, like what role do I have to play in social impact and if any. Um, so that was pretty great. And then I think also um, it made you really question like the questions that um, that program made us ask is like, what is your impact, right? Like, can you point to like this equals this equals this and this is happening? And I really started to take a step back from even alter eco. I was like, are we really doing all the things that we say we are? Like, yes, we are in some way, but is it directly impacting? And so it made me, it made me kind of bring up a lot of questions and then, um, our company is actually like 15 years old from the founders who started like two French guys, Matt and Ed started it back when like natural food wasn't as big. And it's been a while since like that very core like mission has carried all the way through the business. So I think it, I like to think that like me starting to have those questions because of this program um, added to some of the fuel of the fire. Like we're really reevaluating like, you know, what do we pay our farmers? Like, how much of that money gets to their pocket, you know, like really mm -hmm. trying to pinpoint and ask some of those questions. Um, and at the time, I think we weren't looking in that way. And I was going through all the 
exercises that we had to go through and try to pinpoint you know, can you measure this? Can you measure this? And I was like, well, I don't, I don't think we can. Like, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> really questioning it. So it, it was really good to um, have that wake up call and have that critical eye. And then um, we had a new CEO come in, I think while, maybe while I was at the program, maybe a little after. And that's just like changed a lot of things. And we're really reevaluating a lot of this stuff. So it's making it feel more authentic, which is really good. And um, the program's really kind of instilled that in me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Kind of like yeah. reorganizing your sock drawer. You have all the right socks, but are they all aligned in a way that? <laughs> yeah, maybe exactly. That's, maybe like, that's a bad metaphor. <laughs> no, I think so. Like we would really always try. Like alter ego's thing is like do everything all the time, and sometimes it doesn't make the most sense, <laughs> or like you can't do everything well all the time. So it's like, what actually are the things that we can make the biggest impact in? Should we like how do we start measuring it, or at least setting up some of the conversations that we can. Um, start doing it in the right way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that exemplifies the value of the program. Um, You know, and and we talk about that value all the time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so Sylvia, you you worked with grass-fed beef company (laughs) and the chocolate uh, uh, company, and you're, I'm sure, well aware of the challenges of creating a sustainable product. Um, Could you talk more about what are still challenges now, especially during a global pandemic? Uh, and wh- which challenges do you think will remain after um, the pandemic is over? Hopefully it will be in a future. Um, yeah. Could you talk more about the challenges of working in this field? Yeah, I think like the number one thing is always going to be cost. You, you can't really get around it. Doing things the right way just costs more. Um, like monetarily i know that not doing things the right way has like all these other externalities and things that long term have a a cost but um it just you know it costs more to have to raise a cow on grass for its whole life than to put it in a feedlot you know and uh it costs more to pay farmers justly um have all the right ingredients don't take shortcuts don't put in preservatives things like that so like that's something that you just can't get around. And it's, I think like consumer um, preferences are starting to change. They're willing to pay more for things and things like that. But it's just um, another thing too, is like how our country values food. I mean, we expect food to just be really cheap. Um, we don't think about like whether the person who picked it was paid enough and all these other things. So, so a lot of the cost and the customer is willing to pay is going into it. But I think we're like kind of coming to a place where people are willing to pay the premium. It's, the next issue then is like, how do you make it accessible to more people um, who can't, you know, shell out an extra dollar or so? Um, so that's like a really, I don't know how, who's going to solve that one. It's going to take a while, systemic change. But I think for, um, for us, and I think for a lot of companies that want to try to do good, I mentioned it before, it's like focus. Um, we want to do everything right. You want to be good on all fronts from, you know, the packaging to the supply chain to the all, all these things. Um, and sometimes, you know, with like your own to-do list or like with business, you have to pick like three to five priorities if you want to get stuff done or if you want to do it well um, and, and be able to just tackle them with a team. We've, we've been pretty good about that lately where we're just like, oh, these are some issues. If we get our minds and like really focus on it, we can really make some big strides versus like kind of surface dealing with Mm -hmm. some stuff Um, and then like focus internally for execution but also focus to consumers right like we have a like this big of a bar package on shelf we can't put like an entire novel on it (laughs) we can't um, we want to put like 10 attributes on it but honestly you have like less than a second to catch someone's eye uh, and make them fall in love with you and make them want to maybe pay more for you so um, really tightening up our impact and what we do and what we focus on to execute on hopefully translates a little bit too into like how we message that um, and how you convince people to buy you on this huge overwhelming shelf of things. Um, and I think like pandemic wise, like all those things still exist. It's just um, more than ever, maybe like taking some of that like business rigor and applying it to like 
our CEO comes from, like he's working with CPG and things like that. And really just being like, what scenarios do we have to run through? What's the best case, worst case? Um, it's like, I've been through a recession before. What does that look like? What's this gonna look like? So things that you don't think of to, we're just like trying to like fulfill orders. He's like, no, we gotta think about the next step and what are we gonna invest in now so that we, when we come out later, it's gonna, um, we're gonna come out on top. So um, yeah, I, I, a lot of this stuff is like, you know, cost focus and really applying like a business rigor or different scenarios to how you do business. And I think long-term you have to uh, work on that anyways. It's just even more urgent now with limited resources, with like changing buyer behaviors and things like that. Um, could you talk more about the supply chain um, and if there are any strategies that or best practices that work well for Alter Eco uh, and how's the supply chain doing now uh, with the pandemic? Yeah, um, well, I'll say the, yeah, the pandemic affects us and it affects places with less infrastructure even more seriously. Like, like we saw like pretty alarming news stories about in uh, Guayaquil in Ecuador, which is pretty close to some of our co-ops for cacao. Like they just got bodies and bags like on the street. You know, they don't have the facilities to, um, and even in New York, I think some of that's happening too. They're not able to like process all the bodies and things. So like, it's just even crazier in um, places with less infrastructure. And luckily a lot of our co-ops are, you know, in rural areas, but then they're cut off from access to supply. Like they can't get enough masks and they're trying to go into harvest um, and they don't have enough hand sanitizer and different things. So they're, they're really trying to um, make it work. So we've been, um, it's been kind of fun. We have these uh, quarterly sustainability teams that you can kind of volunteer to be on. We like tackle project. And this one, because of the, like the timing, we were doing a donation outreach with them. And so I was able to like use some of my Spanish and like talk to some of the co-ops that I visited last year um, and figure out like what their needs are and like what their budgets are. And so we organized a bit of a don donation campaign um, and we got some of our retail partners um, and other people to donate. So that's been um, really good. And I think because they're set up in a very resilient way, these farmer co-ops, they're, we, so we pay them a fair trade premium. They take a lot of those premiums and democratically as a group decide how to um, use that within the community. And that's kind of the power of organizing a community and paying people enough to where they have this little like, like nest egg that they can reach into when things like this happen. When you're paying someone at market rate and they're just kind of trying to get by or not even come in cost you can't have this kind of thing so they already like proactively on their own were pooling the resources and like meeting and deciding we're going to allocate x amount to reaching the most vulnerable uh, families first and providing them with like food subsidies because they weren't able to trade among the regions sometimes some of the distribution routes got cut off so it's been really cool to see like them just empower themselves because of the structure and this like very resilient and fair trade premium um, supply chain able to fix that for themselves but then also us like with that relationship being able to then supplement with donations on the side mm -hmm. so that's been yeah pretty rewarding in the past few weeks i think yeah um, the proof is in the pudding right so you've invested all this time and energy in creating these, uh, supporting these co-ops and creating these long-term relationships. And uh, now it seems like they are more resilient than those who are not part of co-ops in these specific regions, right? Yeah, it's, it's very cool to see, you know, you, because I think sometimes you think when you work with, um, you know, like the Global South or something, you know, you're gonna come in and maybe save them or something, but it's very cool to see if you set things up in the right way, they can have the resources to kind of mobilize and um, do things on their own. So it's been awesome. So if, it, if the campaign is still active, we'd be happy to share that in the show. Oh notes. yeah, that would be cool. Uh, uh, yeah. We just hit, I think we hit like, just like 5,000 um, a week ago or so. And then we're going to distribute that out as soon as possible. And then, yeah, our goal was 10,000 because they already raised some on their own. Well, we'll, we'll be happy to contribute and help awesome. spread the word. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so that's like, um, I guess the more COVID-19 kind of perspective. Um, I think 
uh, in terms of like sustainable supply chains and setting them up. Um, our, our founders, like a, a long time ago, 15 years ago, they, they, it came from a really authentic, genuine place. They were just like, had access to these farmer communities and they wanted to give them a market versus kind of like, I want to sell something, then I want to set up a sustainable supply chain. Um, and they had to get a lot of people on board. I think they, at some point, the Whole Foods pres or president or CEO, he's been on one of our co-op trips because they didn't really understand what fair trade was about. You had to like really convince them to get on board. Yeah, it's kind of cool. We They take us to, through like an old slideshow of um, like history of Alter Eco. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they, they took like the CEO of Whole Foods on a co-op trip, I think the CEO of uh, Fair Trade USA too. Um, and then I think it's had like ripples effects through like our, so we don't manufacture our own chocolate, but our manufacturer has like, since then they're like a champion now too in the sustainable sourcing space. So um, I think like just coming from that very authentic space, but it's not to say that you always have to like, you know, be trudging through the jungle and find, <laughs> I don't know, a co-op and then figure out and then say, let's start a company and help them out. Um, but I think it's just kind of really um, being genuine and where it comes from and trying to apply it through all ports of your supply chain. And and like, like I said before, um, through the CSIS program, 15 years later, thinking like, are we still as connected as we used to be? Do we need to reevaluate some of that? Like, now that we're bigger and have more scale, um, you know, there are more middlemen involved and like how much of that dollar gets into the farmer's pocket and really looking at it again and always trying to make sure you have that impact at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really helpful tool to have continuously. Um, like you said, reevaluating re those strategies because um, things change, right? I mean, you said 15 years. A lot has changed in 15 years. Yeah, um, a lot has changed in the last three months. I know. <laughs> I know more than has changed in maybe 15 years, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm curious about packaging. If you are willing to talk about uh, the packaging uh, strategy, so I know that company has a really robust waste goal. And so you've shifted some of the packaging. Can you talk more about that process and what it was like? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think uh, a lot of it actually happened before my time in like true alter ego fashion, like trying to do everything. The approach was full circle sustainability. So that just doesn't mean, you know, what goes in is also like what comes in at the end of the waste stream. Um, so I think it was just a couple really passionate champions who said, let's figure out how to make the first compostable pouch for our quinoa. And then next it was the compostable truffle wrapper, the like foil looking ones that are actually like made out of eucalyptus and fully compostable in two months. We're actually working on getting the backyard certification for that backyard compostable certification. We so that's pretty that. cool. Okay. Yeah, I'm working on that now. Um, so that, that was like always very groundbreaking at the time, like five years ago when that started. Um, and we've always kept that in mind, like if we were to launch something new, if the only option is landfill, like what's our transition plan to eventually get it to be recyclable or at best compostable. Um, so, you know, fast forward a few years and you look around and like a lot of things are actually pretty close to being compostable or recyclable. If you like are really mindful about what you do, like boxes are recyclable and like foil on our bars is recyclable. Um, and so now it's like, um, in the past, like, I think maybe six months, I've taken on the role of more of a innovation and projects throughout the company, leading those and kind of carrying them through to execution. And now it's about phasing it out. Like, what's the next thing that we can try to do next? So like our, um, some of our truffles come in boxes that have like a sticker seal on it that's not compostable or um, some of the boxes are shrink wrapped so that they're shipped to the stores and then, you know, all preserved and things like that. And we start asking questions like, do we have to have it shrink wrap? Like, why do we need to put a sticker on it? Can we find a compostable sticker? And we started looking at compostable stickers for a few months. And then the question was, do we need a sticker? Can we just change the dye line so that the dye line of the box so that it can like lock in without anything sticking it? So it's like kind of asking these next questions and you realize you're like not so far from the end goal if you're kind of always like 
asking those things. And then, so for um, 2020, we're committing to do everything um, consumer facing will be recyclable or compostable. And then um, we actually made a whole inventory of like every single piece of packaging, which is actually, you like forget all the stuff like ice packs that go into um, e-commerce stuff or the tape on the boxes or the pallets that you like put stuff on. So you can get like pretty exhausted pretty quick. Um, and so then I think in the next few months we'll start phasing out 2021 and 2022, like which little block that we do we capture next? Cause for now we'll try to figure out, you know, these stickers and things like that. But you know, who knows, it would be really cool to in, a, in three years say everything end to end from the stuff you see at the warehouse that you don't see on the shelf will be, you know, from the glue and like things like that will be um, all compostable. Yeah, it's so exciting to hear about a company asking so many questions like that and truly looking at every little single piece, which is important. And, I, you know, I want us to talk about innovation that you mentioned. I think now more than ever, we're seeing the value in innovation and in research and development, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and R&D and, and innovation are critical to the success of sustainable products as well. So in your view, what is the importance of investing in R&D and how does it give a competitive advantage? Yeah, it, it's so important because um, I think the investment you make in innovation now is really what you see on shelf in like three or five years. Or like some of the stuff really takes that long. Now that I've had a few months to figure out like all the moving pieces and like how long it takes to, you know, figure out this one formula or try this new box that no one's ever tried. Um, it really does take a long time. So the things and the ideas that you put into this funnel now really will reap you the benefits in like at least three years or so. Um, so, and I think, uh, especially during a pandemic era, like everyone's thinking, you know, I just have to like keep the doors open and like survive. And the people that can like really hunker down and figure out like, I'm gonna invest, like how am I gonna build my brand stronger? Or how am I gonna um, launch new products when some of this is over so that when we all come back, we can like have an advantage. Cause if, if you kind of let it go for a while, then you're behind. Um, and we saw that a bit like, for a while, Alter Eco, like a lot of things have changed in the past 15 years. It used to be you could walk into like a Whole Foods, talk to the store manager and just be really passionate, have a really cool story. And they'll probably put your product on shelf. Right. Um, you know, there weren't that many players. So you could be like, I have the first like gluten-free whatever. And then um, the store, like if you were just persistent enough and like knocked on doors, you could get it to work. But um, we're kind of like at that golden age. It's, it's good and challenging in some ways where now there's so many products out there. Um, everything is like moving towards how big CPG does stuff, how like big retailers do, like you see Whole Foods acting more, you know, cause they got bought by Amazon. You see them acting more in like how big conventional retailers are acting. Um, they use data to inform everything. So you really gotta come up, you have to keep innovating and keep, on top of your data and your your story to stay on shelf because if not like someone's gonna come in and take the next spot um the past few years you know alter egos has like they built up really well and i think maybe like two three years ago you know we reached a really critical point and then kind of like let it ride and i think some of those years where you let it ride we saw so many new players come up we saw like lily's chocolate which is um like a, a stevia sugar-free bait like just so many new players that keep coming into the space um and and you can't kind of sit on your laurels and like think about like well we have a great story we do everything right it's like who's who's gonna hear about that or who's gonna care when you're no longer or when they can't find you at this one store anymore mm -hmm. and i think so it's it's kind of like you can't you have to keep moving um and keep investing in the innovation and like like big cpg knows that innovation is the like fastest way to keep growing it's not just like once you're in all the stores the only thing you can do is like keep doing new stuff so you had to start thinking in that way yeah and, and collaboration and innovation can give you an advantage too like how mm -hmm. alter eco is part of this packaging collaborative 
yeah, uh, with yeah. all these other companies, which is pretty cool. So it's like if, you know, one company's innovating, trying to share that uh, with other companies to kind of move the industry forward. Yeah, it's it's very cool to see like all these new companies come up and um, everyone's kind of supporting each other and like packaging collaborative. There's the climate collaborative, which is making a lot of big impact. They're all aligning towards climate commitments and working actually like meeting with policymakers and things together too. So kind of power of coalitions is very cool in moving progress forward. Mm -hmm. So how might we still make the, the business case for better social and environmental practices during this crisis in the aftermath? You know, we're thinking about how companies have had to maybe cut staff, furlough people, are thinking about their budgets. Uh, and, and we know the companies that are resilient throughout this are the ones that have innovated, invested in research, are doing things in a sustainable way. Um, so how might we still make that case for companies? Yeah, I think um, a lot of, I mean, I've been reading so many trend reports because every week it's like, run a new scenario on the forecast <laughs> or whatever. Um, but a lot of people, especially like in the food industry and, you know, us hippies in the food industry, in the natural food industry, <laughs> we're like, a lot of us think this like pandemic is kind of a, a wake up call of nature being out of balance, like a lot of things being out of balance. Um, and the need for like climate change mitigation, more sustainable practices, um, nutrition, all that kind of stuff, food as medicine, like all that stuff, I, we feel like it's stronger than ever. And I think consumers are going to come around to that, that too. Like people are you know, spending more time at home cooking and like really figuring out what's important to them. So I think, I think everyone's shifting towards that way of thinking and whether consciously or subconsciously, we're all kind of thinking of how to, you know, this has been like a real wake up call for a lot of people. Of like, how can I be healthier? How can I like have a more sustainable lifestyle so that I can create more for my like future generations and things like that. So I think people are really um, like, that's like the next big trend is that sustainability and social impact is going to be the thing that people carry people people really flock towards like after all this. I mean, it does cost more money and there's a lot of like economic hard hit things. Um, but that like when they're choosing between two things of maybe the same price, they're definitely going to be thinking more about the sustainable and social impact of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We can see more consumer driven demands on companies, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just like how, Oh, sorry. Um, just thinking like, you know, a lot of people are being laid off and, and things like that, like companies that have a more resilient or like are really investing in their employees and like paying suppliers and things like that more justly, like that, that stuff kind of carries through. It's short term for growth, not the best thing, but long term, it, it kind of weathers you through some storms, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about if uh, other companies, uh, individuals uh, who are working in companies and trying to be more sustainable uh, and more socially responsible come to you for advice uh, and what do you usually share? Uh, or another, another way to ask this question, what, what advice would you share with companies that mm -hmm. are seeking that type of uh, advice and direction? Yeah, um, I think it, a lot of it is staying true and being authentic and relevant to your mission. Um, you know, you don't want to start a program that's completely unrelated to the product or the supply chain that you go through with. Um, we, we point to the brand a lot that just puts like an animal on the front of their packaging and 10% of proceeds go to them. And then you look at their website and you're like, I'm not really sure how you chose who to donate this money to. But anyways, um, so I think people are, like consumers are getting smart too. They're like seeing through a lot of the BS. So you really have to just like stick with, you know, what you know and what's relevant and the biggest impact that you can make. Um, <clears throat> and I guess another thing is like kind of what we've talked about with CSIS, like really having that business mindset um, to make sure that you are a, a beautiful cause, 
that has the like punch to execute and make it happen, right? Um, like that that cause is so important because you know I I'm never that the per like I always think founders are all a little crazy. Like <laughs> no offense to out there, but like you gotta be a little crazy to be like just believe like I have the one thing that's gonna make it happen and like go knock on doors and like not know where your next paycheck is going to come from and things like that. And that, you know, you need that. And, but you also have to marry it with the people that are going to then, once you have gotten that first hold into the market, like really carry that through. So I know I'm not that person, but that, that piece is so important. And then you got to apply the rigor to it to like make it all kind of see all the way through. Yeah, that's fantastic. Okay. So we have four questions we like to ask everyone. Uh, we want to get to these. So who is someone that inspires you, whether it's in your work or, or your life? Uh, I, I think a lot of, like a lot of those founder figures are very inspiring. Cause I just don't have, like, I haven't had that same kind of crazy energy. So like the founders of our company are super inspiring. A lot of other people in the natural food space and like seeing how they like met someone at, I don't know in the jungle and then, like decided I need to bring this amazing like superfood to life. Um, that's always really cool to see. Um, but at the same time, like I recently I've uh, had a new boss and she, it's actually been very cool. Um, she's Asian American like me, tiny like me and like kicking butt. Um, so I, uh, another thing that, um, Alter Eco, we're part of this uh, community called um, OSC2. And the next thing that they're, the next initiative that they're working on is this Jedi initiative, which is about like inclusivity and diversity and things like that. And I, I think like some of that's so important because I was like, wow, I haven't, if I think back on my career, I actually haven't had too many like petite Asian women I can look up to in leadership positions. So it looks um, like you, right? Yeah, exactly. So that's been very cool to just like see that. Um, and yeah, and also it's just nice to have like little bits of inspiration, like going to the um, pen, like when we all were together at the convening, you know, you, sometimes you like feel like, oh, I'm like going through my job. I don't know if I'm making any social impact. And then you go like talk to all these amazing people. You're like, wow, people are doing cool stuff. So even if you have no idea really what they're doing or like um, you've just met them, it's very cool to like see get that little breath of inspiration come out mm -hmm. for you. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Mm -hmm. So who, uh, or what is your favorite sustainability or social impact book or resource? Mm. So um, confession, I'm not a great nonfiction reader. <laughs> <laughs> um, but when I was very in the like fever of trying to get into food, I did read Cradle to Cradle was very good. I like, and I think like very relevant with some of the, um, pen stuff too that we learned about design thinking and things like that mm -hmm. so that was great um, I also read cooking up a business which is which is just like a lot of inspirational a lot of this is very food themed but um uh, a lot of inspirational stories from entrepreneurs who start like the Justin's peanut butter guy and like how he started making his nut butter for like people who like to climb um so it's kind of cool to read that um and then I'll throw in like a non- or a, a fiction one. I've been reading Overstory. Um, actually, don't know who the author Our is. Trees. Yeah, so that the tree. It's so cool. It, it's like a lot of fictional stories woven in, but a lot of tree knowledge in there, and it's very inspirational. You learn the coolest things about how trees, you know, pool resources and like join roots underground and like become what. Like it's very cool. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, we'll link to uh, some of those in, in the show notes as well. Oh, nice. Um, okay, what energizes you in your work? I know we talked a little bit about that, but if there's anything specific that energizes you. Um, yeah, I think I'm always energized by a challenge. Um, I kind of get bored after a few months, <laughs> uh, unfortunately. So I like if it's if it's a sticky situation, and I think I can solve it, like, I'm on it, <laughs> kind of thing, so that kind of stuff really gets me pumped up, um, and I like to think of myself as more of an introvert, but I do like seeing, like, the power of teamwork get a lot of that stuff done, like, 
we had it's sticky because a lot of people had to work together to get it done if it was just one person like you know it's actually not that complicated but having different teams and things get together and like you really see how that how the mindset of people improve like I've, I've been organizing some of the um product launches and just like meeting once a week and getting everyone's input and keeping people informed it just changes how motivated people are to help you and how how productive you are and how um, successful you are at executing like getting everyone on the same page so that kind of power of teamwork has been really cool to watch too mm -hmm. yeah and what do you do to restore yourself um so i live right by golden gate park <laughs> it's very foggy right now so been doing a lot of uh walks to get off blow off steam get the energy out uh, i've been doing like a daily zoom workout call with some friends that i actually had in a like half an hour um and i got um a skateboard for my birthday because i mentioned to nice. <laughs> my partner that like i've been wanting like i said like oh i always wanted to learn how to do that but i kind of mentioned it offhand and he actually got it for me <laughs> that is great skating yeah. and like living out like my skater boy like skater girl avril lavigne dream like yes. teenage dream <laughs> uh, it's actually been really cool because you forget as an adult like how fun learning a new thing is something like a new skill that you just have to like fall or like try a lot that like, you, you just don't do it a lot when you get older that's so true um so it's been kind of fun just being like i'm getting better like now i can like i only fell one time <laughs> but, like i feel like i have some control of the board so that's been really fun oh that's cool sylvia this has relate. been yeah <laughs> this well, has I been a fan oh sorry go ahead go ahead could I ask one more question that we, yeah. so we asked each other in the beginning, the highlight of our week and we forgot to ask you that. So oh. I'm gonna give you a chance to respond if you would like. The highlight of my week. We had, hmm, well, Memorial Day, um, long weekend was really nice. Mm -hmm. um, and Alex and I, my partner and I, we went on a, bike ride um like a socially distanced one across the bay um that was really nice it was just it was one of the hottest weekends we got a heat advisory because in san francisco when it's above 80 you get heat advisories over <laughs> here <laughs> and uh, it was like one of the hottest days but yeah we drove up into the berkeley open hills and had like a, a nice long bike ride um there were cows around and yeah it was just nice and restorative and got some good food berkeley has great food got some of that afterward so that was just a really um nice restorative tiring thing to have that extra day for oh yeah that sounds so nice mm. yeah this this conversation has been so fantastic we really appreciate you sharing everything you know about you about the company um we're gonna link to some things and uh, we'd love to share the uh, alter eco uh, campaign to support the the co-op yeah that'd be awesome yeah we'll definitely share that in the notes so thanks again sylvia this was so awesome we appreciate thank you, it sylvia. thank you guys this has been really good so good to connect and uh actually really nice to reflect a bit too on the questions that you asked me so awesome. that's awesome thanks. have a great day you Bye. too yeah. oh yeah gotta get ready <laughs> <laughs> Bye. 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 take care